for having me over. And it's going from birth to death. I don't like to use the word here. Uh, the fact that majority of critical care is actually, 25% of my care is actually taking care of the dying patient. Uh, and that's about, uh, that's some sub uh, what we do. Uh, but uh, there is, uh, so when you talk about care in an intensive care unit, uh, yes, we try to prolong life, we try to give new life, but a majority of the time there is an element of uh, caring for the dying patient. And that pr uh, becomes an important part when we discuss about uh, uh, the thing. So when I was asked to give a, a paper or not talk about this subject and say involve cerebral palsy patient and say how do we treat these patients in the intensive care unit, I, you know, I was thinking, okay, uh, this is something which uh, even I don't wish my best, en my worst enemy to uh, come to the intensive care, isn't it? You don't want your enemy also to be in the intensive care unit. It's that kind of a situation. So if you are looking at it, so what what I said was I'm going to ask, what is the need for intensive care unit that a patient with cerebral palsy might have? And uh, if, you, if you need to come to the ICU, what is the management plan? Uh, discuss the outcomes. It's important to understand that uh, any cost, uh, in any intensive therapy, which is obviously cost, will suck in cost, is going to be, you need to ask, am I going to help the patient by doing this therapy? And uh, finally, you know, you need to talk about when care is getting futile, medical care gets futile, uh, patients are on a ventilator for many days, we need to talk, ask about ourselves, are we doing the right thing by continuing the therapy and should an end of life care be uh, that question be asked at that particular time. Uh, we have heard this throughout the day, I believe. Uh, cerebral palsy is a non-progressive disorder. Uh, although the disorder itself is not progressive, I like to point out that the appearance of neuropathological lesions in the clinical expression may change over time as the brain matures. So you might have more seizures as you grow older, though your disease per se doesn't progress, but you may have other neuropathological changes which may be progressive as compared to a, a classical static non-progressive disorder. But even then, a cerebral palsy is a non-progressive disorder. Uh, basically, they are abnormal motor activities and posture related. So in affected patient, a voluntary movement becomes very complex, coordinated and varied. And uh, it's, uh, it becomes very, so a normal complex movement of coordinating and putting your hand in your mouth and feeding can become very complex and uh, uncoordinated, stereotypic and limited. And simple actions that are performed unconsciously by a majority of the patients are required marked effort and concentration, which you know, and that's why the physical therapy, uh, speech therapy, everything becomes very important. And uh, and severely attacked individuals, what we see is an even an uh, attempted voluntary movement may evoke a primitive reflex, reflex a co-contraction of agonist and antagonist muscles, and mass movements can happen, which can result in a lot of things. A majority of the time when we talk about in these kind of symposia, we're talking about people with very limited disability. But when we talk about people with large amount of disability, uh, some, the cerebral palsy syndromes can be of varying types. And when we talk about cerebral palsy syndromes, you know, you have the spastic, you have the dyskinetic syndromes, and the ataxic kinds, which I think Dr. Jayantara uh, kind of alluded to, and Dr. Uh, and, and pediatric neurologist also kind of told about. And um, we, in, a lot of times we see the, uh, the good functionality happens with diplegias and uh, hemiplegias. And the quadriplegics are the worst affected, and the dyskinetic ones can, have, can be much more uh, visually distracting, but they generally are otherwise uh, not, not of an issue as far as managing concerned. But what we, in intensive care, it is the associated disorder that gets them. These are the, the, the pre previous manifestation of cerebral palsy is what results in the care of the cerebral palsy patient, but it's the associated disorder which, uh, which leads to uh, the care. So of these associated disorders, I am not involved in a majority of them, uh, like the neurodevelopmental intellect, epilepsy. We've had discussion on all of these uh, one by one. But what eventually leads to, for us, the main problem is pulmonary disease and uh, the associated uh, result of uh, orthopedic surgery and urinary infections and urinary incontinence, which leads them to uh, come to the intensive care unit that I really see them. So when you talk about ICU admissions for patients with non-progressive degenerative disease, non-progressive uh, disease like a cerebral palsy, uh, it's basically, uh, as uh, Dr. Arjit discussed, it's mainly about epilepsy and status epilepticus. So what brings your patient to the intensive care unit is a seizure at home, in the off, in, in a workplace, in a school, uh, wherever that you have a seizure and you have continuing seizures. That's the number one majority reason for why people come in. As they get older, we see a lot of children coming in with aspiration pneumonia and respiratory failure. And I'll talk a little bit about why they get into respiratory failure uh, as they get older. And uh, post-operative orthopedic procedure, Dr. Shaikat just talked about the anesthesia and he talked about the HDU care and the care that is required in ICU sometimes because they're hypothermic, hypoxemic and hypovolemic that brings them to the intensive care unit for 
care following an orthopedic procedure, uh, whether for scoliosis correction, whether for contraction release, or whatever it is said in them. And last but not least, the least, is that the rates of infection are the same in any group of patients as, and as, as in the cerebral palsy group. So if you have a patient in the intensive care unit, an elderly gentleman with cerebral palsy, the chances of you getting a UTI, nosocomial, or an hospital-acquired infections are about the same that will happen in what will happen in a patient with cerebral palsy as would happen in a non-cerebral palsy patient. And that's something which is not there, but that is the single most important morbidity that is contributed by the this thing uh, by the disease. Uh, epilepsy, as I said, is 25, uh, Arjit already pointed out, 25 to 45 percent of patients. Uh, seizures are much more common in the spastic quadriplegia and acquired hemiplegia and less common in the mild symmetric spastic diplegia and the CP that is mainly athetoid. So it's mainly the uh, quadriplegic and the acquired hemiplegia there, the epilepsy is common and that leads to a lot of uh, admissions to the intensive care unit and we had a nice paper presentation so I'm not going to deliberate anything any further on that. Pulmonary disorder, which is what uh, we as chest physician deal with a lot is, is the leading cause of death in people who grow into adulthood uh, or children who get into any sort of the any sort of adulthood. So the death in intensive care of patients with cerebral palsy happens because of chronic pulmonary disease. The chronic pulmonary disease is of uh, two is basically it's of two reasons, and both are because of the inability of the lung to exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen, and that's because of what is called as respiratory failure. And the respiratory failure predominantly happens because of recurrent aspiration, which is the number one cause, or and more more importantly, the gastroesophageal recurrent aspiration occurs because of gastroesophageal reflux or because of a palatopharyngeal incoordination because the act of swallowing this saliva that I have in my mouth requires the coordination of the palate and the pharynx and that is sometimes, especially in a spastic child, uh, can be a big, big issue. And the other important thing that leads to, res is to respiratory failure is restrictive lung disease and that restrictive lung disease is because of uh, scoliosis. So when we talk about uh, aspiration pneumonia and these are micro aspiration, these are not aspiration of, aspiration of your saliva. Uh, which is predominantly. We're not talking about the Mendelssohn syndrome where you have large vomitus going into your patient uh, as a result of it. This is micro aspiration that happens and this results in the acid especially from your lower esophage, lower gastrointestinal, upper gastrointestinal tract leading into the lungs and leading to pulmonary injury. So this may result in an acute injury like a pneumonia which leads to a hospitalization or may lead to chronic uh, pulmonary disease and leads to also the gastroesophageal reflux leads to impaired nutritional intake, failure to thrive which makes these patients much more vulnerable to secondary infections on these complicated. Uh, video fluoroscopic swallow is what kind of diagnosis in uh, this slide kind of slows in the arrow. That's the, uh, the uh, the video fluoroscopic study showing the modified barium uh, in the patient with a 12 year old with chronic cough with the modified barium in the in the trachea. So this kind of video fluoroscopic evaluation kind of highlights the importance of aspiration that happens and the, a swallow assessment and a speech therapist therefore actually become a very important component which is what we heard in our deliberation on physical therapy is that it's actually important to do this and do it scientifically with video fluoroscopic evaluation to be done. We in our institution do what is called as focused endoscopic evaluation of swallowing which is called FEAS which is actually uh, being staying at the back of the nasopharynx, giving them some food which can be swallowed and then observing the swallowing reflex which is probably easier to do than to do a video swallowing, a video fluoroscopic swallow study. The other, as I said, important is the thoracolumbar scoliosis and uh, this is a, a very, very common issue because of uh, in, this, in this group of patients, lateral curvature of the spine is accompanied by rotation and leads to the lung is like a bucket handle. The classical description of a lung is like a bucket handle. If you, even if you might be a Salman Khan, you cannot lift a full bucket of water if you don't lift it in the middle of the bucket. So that's in, that's the similar way the chest, you cannot expand it properly if it's not like a bucket handle and the more stress you put on a non-bucket handle kind of a movement of your chest, you're going to end up with uh, respiratory failure and that is bound to happen. And uh, there are tests like this, the Adams forward bend test which gives you an image of how a patient's how much amount of uh, rib prominence that you see on one side that tells you the degree of scoliosis and good spine surgeons all and in the major number of number one surgery that is done for patients with cerebral palsy is actually scoliosis correction, especially when they have a significant scoliosis that is leading to carbon dioxide retention and the problem of uh, respiratory failure coming into them. So this is the situation when you really want to do it. As I said, the other reason that brings the patient to the ICU is orthopedic disorders like subluxation, dislocation, dysplasia of the hips, foot deformity and as I said scoliosis. So they may require orthotics, they may require postural management or surgical intervention and they require post-operative ICU or HDU care 